Usually I spend the last half hour preparing for the show, but I could not do that this morning. I mean, it's kind of show content, but um, I ended up doing this deep dive. By the way, happy Friday into the Stolen KC Facebook page. Because I'm reading this on Fox 4 last night that an Overland Park couple has two cars stolen in the middle of the night. Their Audi and their Ford Explorer. And they had no idea, of course, that their cars were gone until the guy Edgar's cell phone pinged at about 5.30 a.m. This is going back a couple of weeks. And basically, they couldn't get any help figuring out where the heck their cars were. So they started doing some sleuthing on this Facebook group, Stolen KC. And that's in part how they eventually found their vehicle. So now I'm going through this entire Facebook group. It's got 175,000 members in it called Stolen KC. And it's got videos and photos and pictures of people who have just either had things, serious things taken, like, you know, cars or just porch pirates. (laughs) This one person has this video up of this lady just walking up to her front porch and taking like, I don't know, looked like a, a bag that probably has jeans and clothes in it. So I, it's a group I was not aware of until about an hour ago, thank goodness. But it's got 175,000 of you in it who are on there and actively trying to help your neighbors find criminals. So good for you. But that being said, when I was reading this story in Overland Park, can, can either of you guys help me with this? Because I can't quite figure it out. Who still leaves their keys in their car in 2024? That's a rookie move right there. I mean, you've got an Audi, and you leave your keys in your Audi in your driveway? Holy, I mean, John, what is it? I mean, you're obviously... It won't happen to me. (laughs) You're well off enough to buy an Audi. I'd like to think that you're smart enough to not leave your keys... In that setting, well, you live in a different world. There, I you're a legend in your own shower. I, I, I <laughs> no. don't know. I'm just so perplexed by people that do that. Well, of course, when you get to my age, you've seen a few more things too. But I am with, <laughs> I'm right there with you on that. It it happened to my ex. Oh, and I'm like, what did he? What you did? What people do it at quick trips and stuff? Oh my goodness! And you're like, I don't know what you're thinking, man. Everybody assumes that they're not the one in a million. But it's not even like it doesn't save you time to leave your keys in your vehicle. Keeping it warm. I what? The other thing that was in here is they left their wallets in their cars. Who leaves a wallet in the car? I mean, even if you're like, I'll put it in the glove compartment. What's the point? You put it in your back pocket. You have it in your purse if you're a female. I, I, I just I, I genuinely can't comprehend it. I'm not trying to overdo it. I just can't understand who does something like that. Well, m- potentially it's misplaced, but again, I think there are people who intentionally do it. You know? I think they are too. As a person who has lost his wallet, you know, you understand that sometimes it gets misplaced, right? Knock on Formica. <laughs> Knock on the wood. <laughs> I just I am so you know, confused by well, people that do that. You know, I uh, got weapons. Yeah. People are like, on my laptop, I'm like, w- w- why? Yeah. You know? What's that all about? The only time that's happened to me is if it's fallen out of my pocket and I've accidentally left it yeah, in there. Right? Oh, yeah. That's I mean, listen, once that overnight that happened. Happens to hit the same time you happen to lose it. Yeah. Other people are just blatant with it. I, oh, man. I, th- this oh, is... they won't take this briefcase. <laughs> right? I mean, if I go anywhere semi-public... I look around the car to make sure, like, if I have a bag, if I have anything out, it's not in full display. If I do have a laptop in the car because it's in my briefcase, yeah, I try to just be a little more aware. But I guess self-awareness is not as common as I thought it was. <laughs> no, we live in an era where there's like a Facebook headline about, you know, and to make sure you don't forget your kids in the car, put something important in the back seat. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> You mean the kid's not important exactly. enough? Exactly. Oh, my goodness. Are you kidding me? It just hurts my head Yeah. in so many yeah. ways. But listen, if you are dealing with any issues, the Stolen KC Facebook group is probably worth your time. The other takeaway from this story is that the cars ended up getting found in uh, Kansas City. 
But now the couple is upset that KCPD is not going to run, uh, you know, a lot of tests. They're not going to do DNA testing. It's like, man, <laughs> your car was stolen in KCMO. We found your car. It's not in good shape. Here's the car. They don't have time to be doing fingerprinting on your vehicle that eventually showed up near the Kansas City Zoo. Sorry. Well, that's kind of the theme down at the tow lot. Ain't got time. No, I, Exactly. You, I went down with my son, you know, to collect stuff. Got 10 minutes, you know. There's yeah. no person. How you doing today? <laughs> my son was like, hey, what's up? Like, you got 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Like, oh, all right. All right. Uh, they'll throw you out. Better get the damn Ain't car and time. move on. Ain't yeah. got time. That's why you keep your damn keys in your house. And same with your wallet. Unbelievable. Now, uh, let's take it from a local crime story to a worldwide crime story. This came down last night from the Wall Street Journal. U.S. is set for airstrikes on Iran uh, this weekend. So, of course, this in the wake of three American soldiers getting killed last weekend by Iranian-backed militias. All Georgia residents, two women, one men. So what's going to happen now? Well, there's going to be a response. And that's that's expected. That's good. But I don't know why the Biden administration is like signaling when the response is going to happen. That's what they're doing. Here was the article from the Wall Street Journal noting Biden has approved plans for multi-day strikes in Iraq and Syria against multiple targets, including Iranian personnel and facilities per U.S. officials. But the response expected to begin as soon as this weekend. Uh, uh, Why don't you give them some specific locations while you're at it, guys? Uh, Anything else you want to make sure that the uh, worst actors on planet Earth know about the airstrikes coming their way? Wall Street Journal headline, U.S. airstrikes in Iraq and Syria expected to begin this weekend. Me, please don't forget to tell them exact times and locations while you're at it. Like... They can't even do a damn retaliatory airstrike right. It's it's like they have so much shame and guilt over it, they leak it to the Wall Street Journal to say, hey, you know, we kind of feel bad about this, so make sure we kind of put it out there, and that way the folks over in uh, Iraq and Syria know what's coming. And I understand. The Wall Street Journal is doing its job. If somebody puts this in your lap, you're going to run with it. But the fact that they have basically signaled to Iranian proxies in Iraq and Syria that, hey, uh, we've got airstrikes coming as soon as this weekend. Boy, anything else you want to tell them? You want to tell them what the uh, drones are going to look like? You know, keep an eye out for something that's uh, green, red with a shade of purple in it that might be coming straight for your head. This is the stuff you should not be doing. The goal per U.S. officials in the Wall Street Journal, is to get Iran and its proxies to dial back their attacks across the region as the White House and its allies pursue talks on a ceasefire between Hamas and Israel that they hope will de-escalate tensions. Iran has sent its own signals insisting it did not order the attack and warning that a U.S. response against Iranian territory or personnel deployed around the region would prompt it to strike back. The Iranians have no regard and no respect for our leadership. None whatsoever. They have effectively said, yeah, you come after us. Well, we're, guess what? We're coming back after you. They think they can bully us. That gives you the perfect perception of where we're at right now on the world stage. When the Iranian thugs are basically saying, you strike us, we're coming right back after you. That's how unafraid they are. Of this administration. Start with Mike in Kansas City. What's up, Mike? Good morning, pal. Yeah, you don't know your history. Uh, Roosevelt called Hitler and told him about Normandy, and uh, Truman <laughs> called Tojo and told him about nuclear bombs. Don't, don't you know that's the way you wage warfare? <laughs> Gee, I mean, I don't pretend to be, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, General Patton, but, you know, uh, nope, this has got to be the dumbest thing that's ever happened in the strategy of the United States military. Oh, it's so true, Mike. Great job. <laughs> oh, man, it's a Friday, and we are just getting started. 
913-408-7957. We've got our last chance at Jordan Peterson tickets today, 715 and 1015. That's one hour away on KCMO. Uh, we have a toxicology report on the three men in the Northland, on the story that's gotten global attention. And uh, we'll tell you what was in that toxicology report and also why it's getting national headlines next on 95.7 FM, KCMO. Shaping up to be a great Friday. Rolling into the weekend here on KCMO Talk Radio. Good morning. Got those Jordan Peterson tickets. Last chances to win today at 7.15 and uh, 11, or 7.15 and 10.15. Excuse me. And also, don't forget to RSVP for Politics in a Pint. Coming up on Thursday, February 15th, we'll be out at Tiffin Jays in Lee's Summit at 6 p.m. with uh, Bill Eigel, who is running for governor of Missouri. Good guy, a lot of energy, uh, controversial in some people's eyes. And if you haven't been out to one since you just started listening on 95.7 FM, join us. If you're out that way, we'll have a good time. Be hanging out, do a little Q&A, get a good meal, and uh, life's good. Now, the Northland story where three men died after the Chiefs game. Uh, This is going back to the final regular season game against the Chargers. This case has gotten national attention. And while we don't have the official toxicology report, we have reports of what are in the toxicology report. And um, News Nation, which has been all over this story, they've had a reporter out here and the whole thing. You know, News Nation is the upstart cable news outlet trying to compete with Fox News and CNN and... um, They're trying to be what CNN used to be, which is just down the middle news. And I found myself watching them last night. I I was like, you know, I'm not going to watch CNN, MSNBC. Um, Fox is now an inch deep in terms of analysis. And I flip on News Nation and I got Dan Abrams, you know, doing some stuff on Patrick Mahomes' dad bod, which was kind of funny. And then they actually had some real news I didn't know about. So I was like, yeah, this is actually pretty good. So according to News Nation, uh, with the death of these three men up in the Northland, family sources report the toxicology report says the men had drugs in their system, including cocaine and, yes, fentanyl. I don't want to make light of it, but, like, is anyone surprised by this? These three guys are partying with their buddy. They end up dead in the backyard, in the snow, And they're not found for a couple of days until the fiancé of one of the deceased finally goes to the house, looks for him, and finds a dead body. And there's these three buddies out on the back porch that are all dead. Now, there's so many questions on this story. Like, I don't know about you, but if I didn't come back from my friend's house that night, Kate would be like, where are you? Now, and she's not someone who's going to be like, you know, watching every move that's not her style but if i didn't come home after the game it wouldn't take until tuesday night for my significant other girlfriend fiance wife to be like gosh i guess i should go looking for him 48 hours it took the fiance of one of these guys to finally go to the house where he was watching the game on sunday and be like oh where is he i mean i I, I don't understand how that happens. I don't know how you're not freaking out by Monday morning. Takes you till Tuesday night to show up? What is that all about? But anyway, uh, we do know, according to reports, that the guys had cocaine and fentanyl. And by the way, KCPD is not investigating this as any kind of homicide with any kind of foul play. But this has gotten worldwide attention. I mean, I've, I've told you that I have friends um, who work in national media, NBC News, Fox elsewhere who have reached out and been like, hey, you guys covering this Northland story? Man, that's crazy. And I'm kind of like, I mean, we're following it, but we're not doing wall-to-wall coverage on it because it seems pretty obvious to anyone with a brain what happened here. These guys got messed up. They were putting things in their body they shouldn't put in their body. And why the homeowner, by the way, is sitting around with dead bodies on his back porch for two days is, yes, question is concerning, but he's claiming that, you know what? I was sleeping it off. I was sleeping off a bender. But in the end, if you got fentanyl in your system, I I don't know what more there is to this story right now. And it could have been like, you know, they maybe took one pill. I mean, it doesn't take yeah. that much. 
I mean, uh, the poor kid, Cooper Davis, high school kid at uh, Mill Valley, whose parents are now doing incredible work around the region, warning of things like fentanyl that are laced in drugs when you don't even know it. And I will tell you, somebody had reached out privately to me and insinuated that the person who was the main resident of this home was notorious for possibly using and possessing laced drugs. So I mean, that's why this stuff is so dangerous. Now, KCTV5 did a report on how and why this story is getting national attention. Let's take a listen. Sharon, well, they tell me two things, relatable and race. Everyone watches the Chiefs game with their best friends, so a lot of people feel as though that could have been them, and they want to know more. No, I, I, I don't really think that's it. I don't ever watch a Chiefs game with any buddies and be like, gosh, could have been me dead on the back porch in the lawn chair after a few hours. Like, no, no, that, that it's really nothing about this story is all that relatable, which is why I'm still confused by it. For me, I think this case is really unique. Mariana Kotlaya, a criminologist with UMKC, isn't surprised with how many eyes are on the investigation. It's kind of a two-prong. There's the details of the case, but also the human element. Ricky Johnson, Clayton McGinney, and David Harrington were found dead in the backyard of this Northland home two days after they met up to watch the Chiefs game. It's a big Sunday night football game. Um, you have these individuals that have gone together to watch the Chiefs game. And so if you are at home, you can see yourself in the shoes of those individuals. It's no. not just a Kansas City case. This case is attracting national attention from numerous outlets. But it's surpassed that, going international. It's even in the Hindustan Times, which, if you didn't know what that is, it's India's leading English news website. Right now, we don't have all the details of the case, and so it allows the public to come up with a million theories. But are there really a million theories? And that's what I've wondered since the very start of this story getting national attention. Frankly, if this were three Raiders fans, I don't think it would be all that compelling. Three Broncos fans, I think the fact that the Chiefs are the hottest team in the NFL, you got Mahomes, Kelsey, Super Bowl, Taylor Swift, I think that's part of what makes this a story. If this is three Seattle Seahawks fans, let's be honest, does the national media care? I don't think so, which tells you how shallow they are. But like since day one, KCPD says no foul play. Okay, probably bad drugs. And the other thing they don't want to talk about is why these bad drugs are here. Can we get to why the fentanyl crisis is a thing? China, Mexico, open border, or is that too complex for national media's, um, you know, simpletons. Coming up, I want to follow up on a story from yesterday with social media and our kids. We'll get to it next on 95.7 FM. We got breaking news all over the place this morning. One hour till the jobs report. And I uh, just came down here. Let's go out to Gobbler's Knob. That's in Puxatawney, Pennsylvania. For those curious, that is... Like north, northeast of Pittsburgh, due west of State College, where Penn State is. It is in the middle of freaking nowhere, Pennsylvania. And that's where we find Poxitani Phil, who gives us the news on whether or not it's going to be an early spring or a late winter. Let's roll it. But what this weather did not provide is a shadow or reason to hide. Glad tidings on this groundhog. An early spring is on the way. <laughs> Woo! And the crowd goes wild. Oh! Woo! Let's go! I mean, that place is going nuts. It looks like Boston after the Red Sox won the 04 series. Uh, oh man, the video's hysterical. I sent it to Mark. You know, a little behind the scenes here. I can't. I, in my studio, I can't hear audio from this computer. So I sent it to Mark. I said, take a listen to this, a Puxatani Phil. This looks hysterical. I mean, the crowd is going bonkers. I, it's like, you know, the Chiefs just won the Super Bowl. Yeah, it's like a Super Bowl parade there in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> Pennsylvania. <laughs> I mean, that's the most exciting thing they've got all year in Puxatani, Pennsylvania. I mean, the place is literally going nuts. I didn't even know there were that many people in Puxatani. 
Yeah, they got their hats on. They got their phones out. They're like cell phoning the whole crowd footage. It's great. <laughs> oh, man. All right, Phil, you came through, buddy. Well, it feels like March here in Kansas City the last week, so I'll take it. Don't let me down there, Phil. Don't let me down. And I think back to that time. Remember when uh, former New York City mayor and communist Bill de Blasio dropped the groundhog that ended up dying? Remember? Oh, gosh, I got to look up when that was. But uh, now that it is Groundhog's Day, it is all good. So good morning. It is so good to be here on KCMO Talk Radio. Poxitani Phil telling us it is going to be an early spring. Nice work there, big guy. Nice, nice job. So uh, this story in the New York Times came out yesterday, and it's one day after we had the big blow up on Capitol Hill, where you had Facebook, TikTok, all the big, big tech CEOs were on Capitol Hill getting grilled by U.S. senators for a hearing. Josh Hawley from Missouri was there, and he gave it to Mark Zuckerberg. He got Mark Zuckerberg of Meta which of course oversees Facebook and Instagram, to turn around and apologize to parents of kids who have committed suicide, in part because of social media bullying. Now, yes, it was in part a dog and pony show. That's undeniable. However, there still is a role to play, I believe, for government in limiting social media use for children because the data is overwhelming on how it impacts their brains, on how it causes uh, social, emotional, mental issues. And as much as I don't like the government more involved in my life, I do think this is one of those cases where it's appropriate. So then, I mean, yesterday, this kind of weaves into the story in the Wall Street Journal that's headlined, Today's Teenagers Anxious About Their Futures and Disillusioned by Politicians. Says here, although it's never been easy to be a teenager, the current generation of young Americans feels particularly apprehensive new polling shows, anxious about their lives, disillusioned about the direction of the country and pessimistic about their future. Just one third of respondents ages 12 to 17 said things were going well for children and teenagers today. This was a survey published on Monday by Common Sense Media. Less than half said they thought they would be better off than their parents when they grew up. A downbeat view shared amongst teenagers in many rich countries. Says here it's not just about teenage angst. A different survey by Gallup has asked the question of young people over time and looked at how their answers have changed. Members of Gen Z, age 12 to 27, are significantly less likely to rate their current and future lives highly than millennials were when they were the same age. Now, why might that be? I do think there's a keeping up with the Joneses on social media that makes many of us realize, hey, someone's got something or someone's doing something that I'm not and I can't do. And before social media, you know, you didn't really have a lot of that, right? You weren't like sharing photos from your latest vacation or your newest car and things of that nature. That just wasn't something that people did. There was no way to do it. But now it's far easier to kind of have that feeling of, well, I'm being left out or, oh, I can't do this or, oh, I can't buy that. So I think a lot of that is just a mind game that social media creates on us that isn't necessarily true, but drives people to this conclusion of someone's always got more than me. And it's true. Someone's always going to have more than you. Someone's always going to have more than me. And that's okay. As adults, though, we can process that and accept it to some degree. Kids can't, right? When you're a teenager and you're on social media, I mean, even thinking back as a millennial to when I was a kid, it's like, all right, if somebody has something you didn't have, you might hear about it at school. They might tell you about it. You might go home to your mom and dad and say, hey, you know, Joey got one of these. Can I get such and such? But now you get inundated with it especially if you have kids on social media. So none of this surprises me. Do I think it's all doom and gloom for the next generation? No, I mean, I I think every generation has its opportunities and has reason to be optimistic. But I do think that this kind of dovetails in to how social media impacts young people in a far more significant way than adults who are for the most part able to process because their brains are fully developed. Kids can't. Right. If you're 12, 13 years old and you're scrolling through Instagram all day, 
And, you know, you're seeing models and you're seeing, you know, incredible amounts of wealth and you're seeing friends and classmates with things that you don't have and celebrity this and celebrity that. It, it, you know, it's different. It messes with you in a way that as a kid, you know, opening up People magazine or something of that ilk just wouldn't have the same impact on your brain as social media does today. So after what I saw this week from Facebook CEO, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg and some of those other CEOs, I just hope that Congress actually does something about it. And it's not just like a cute soundbite for Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz and, by the way, Democrats as well to kind of pat themselves in the back over. Because we've seen this before, right? We've seen these folks come to Capitol Hill, get shamed and blasted by Congress, and then who ends up getting the last laugh? They do. As Facebook rakes in, I mean, you know, billions of dollars a year. They had their fourth quarter earnings yesterday. Let me pull this up real quick. And it was astronomical. They posted a net income of $14 billion for three months. Uh, That is up from $4.5 billion in the same period of 2022. So that's a 201% increase in net income in Meta in the fourth quarter. So you really think Mark Zuckerberg walked out of that meeting a couple of days ago like, boy, I don't know how I'm going to move on. Josh Hawley, man, that guy, he really got me. No, he's laughing all the way to the bank. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg's making in 30 minutes what Josh Hawley made in a year as a U.S. senator. And as long as Josh Hawley and U.S. senators aren't actually doing anything about it, then I'm not anticipating some kind of big windfall against big tech. And this is the biggest problem with D.C. on the right and the left. They'll talk a very big game. But when push comes to shove, are they going to do anything about it? I highly doubt it. Which is why it's our job as parents to figure out how to best protect our kids. And I know some of you are like, hey, I don't think that Mark Zuckerberg should be punished at all for this. It's up to me to parent my kids. I, I get it, and it is. But I also think there is a role of the federal government here to be involved and to look at the data, and the data overwhelmingly suggests Social media has a net negative impact on our kids. So from a societal perspective, they do have a role. Yes, we have the ultimate role as parents, but they do have a role here for the betterment of society. 913-408-7957. That's our studio line and our uh, text line here on KCMO Talk Radio 95.7 FM. As we approach 7 o'clock, Dr. Jordan Peterson tickets in a half hour at 715. Don't miss that on KCMO Talk Radio. Meantime, coming up, we've got some new polling that has come out. And it goes to show you this is going to be a very long next 9 to 10 months. I'll tell you why next on 95.7 FM. Way to go, Puxatawney Phil. That a boy. That a boy. Nice work. No shadow. Early spring per the big guy. Good morning. It's great to be wrapping up the week with you. Are we calling this a Red Friday even though there's no game on Sunday? I think oh, we yeah. are. I think that's what we do. Four-year anniversary of their last time they beat the 49ers Is that today? today? So, yeah. Four-year anniversary. Very good work there, Mark. Nice little tidbit on a uh, Friday morning here on KCMO Talk Radio. No Kendall Gammon top of the hour. We're going to save him for next week. So, get it all set. I'm already lining up some good Super Bowl guests next week, including Patrick Mahomes' as high school quarterback coach. So, I'm looking forward to, uh, to that and much more. Jim's out east. What do you got for me there, Jim? Good morning. Uh, good morning. Hey, Pete, the, the thing I'm trying to – make a point about is you want to hold meta accountable for what these kids are doing it's the same way with the liberals want to hold the gun manufacturers responsible for what a kid does with a gun Mm. okay uh very very fair point very fair point that's got brought up before and a lot of people have said they have not liked josh hawley doing what he did to zuckerberg um for that very reason And I see that point. What I'm saying is more about putting limitations on who can use it. I don't think, to your point, that Mark Zuckerberg is responsible for what a child did to themselves. Parents have to be vigilant. I agree. But I still still think that we can take steps and the government should take steps to say, hey, um, under 16, 18, whatever the age is, you can't be on this stuff because it's not good for your mental health, and the data overwhelmingly suggests it. But I agree. I mean, I think it's a little cheap for Holly to blame the death of these kids on Mark Zuckerberg. Exactly. I mean, but 
there's still regulations as to who can own a gun at what age. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exa- exactly. It, bingo. Just like smoking, okay. owning a gun, uh, buying beer. I mean, there are age restrictions for a reason. And, and that's all I'm asking for. I'm not sitting here saying Zuckerberg's got blood on his hands. I don't think that's fair at all. No, it's not. Yeah. Okay. We're on the same all page, right. Jim. Okay. Good deal, man. But yeah, I, right. trust me, I heard from a lot of folks saying that are Josh Hawley supporters who are like, they don't like what Josh did for the exact point Jim brought up there. So, uh, and, and I'm totally understanding of that. But I do want to put more pressure on these companies and ultimately just pass legislation. That's why, and I like Josh Hawley. I'll see him in a couple of weeks. I'm going to introduce him at the Missouri GOP uh annual event i'm forgetting the name of it lincoln days annual event that they do here in kansas city i'm going to introduce him on friday and he's always been good to us he's been good to the show but i do agree with exactly the point jim made there it's like are we really going to do what the left does when it comes to you got blood on your hands no just pass legislation it's also why i can't envision a scenario where i ever in my lifetime, vote for a U.S. senator to be president because they don't do squat. I wanted to say something else, but they don't do squat. They make loud noises. They perform. They're kind of government-subsidized actors and actresses at this point. Like They don't do anything. And I say this as somebody who really liked Ted Cruz eight years ago. But they don't do anything. Like, they don't accomplish or do anything. They're paid for government-subsidized TV talking heads. That's it. I can't envision myself ever voting for a U.S. senator for president. But you think back, I mean, through the years of and the centuries of this country, becoming a U.S. senator was oftentimes a path to maybe running for president. And maybe some end up doing it, but I'm just telling you, I wouldn't vote for one at this point. I mean, they're so worthless. It's crazy. Um, All right, some new polling is out. And it suggests uh, that, first off, Donald Trump's in a good place against Joe Biden in the swing states. Now, I know people are going to look at national polls that have come out this week and say Biden's up by six in this Quinnipiac poll from a couple of days ago. But um, the more important part is what's going on in the swing states. And in the swing states... Donald Trump is leading almost every one of them in multiple polls. It's not like it's one poll where it's an outlier. Almost every poll has Donald Trump leading in swing states. Okay, so where is he struggling? What are his issues? His issues are female voters. New polling, this also from Quinnipiac, shows that Joe Biden's strong numbers are driven in part by 58% of female voters. 52% of independents and 62% of voters with college degrees. All places that we know Donald Trump struggles. So can he close that gap? The only thing that Donald Trump should care about for the next 276 days is how do I win over female voters, independents, and those with college degrees? That's it. That's the only thing he needs to think at all about. The base is not going anywhere. Whether it's his VP pick, whether it's what he's putting out on Truth Social, whether it's anything he's saying at rallies, on TV, the only thing that should consume Donald Trump's mind over the next nine, ten months, female voters, independents, college degrees, that's it. He should think about suburban moms in Overland Park, Olathe, Leewood, Lee Summit, Liberty. That's it. Now, yesterday I was flipping on CNBC and there was uh, this report from Frank Luntz who had on his fake wig and was looking pretty good here in this clip. But here's what he had to say on this uh, on the polls and Biden Trump. So, Frank, here's the the, the thing that I can't figure out is, are you suggesting and you've been associated as being um, considered a a, 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 and people have described you as a Republican pollster? I don't know if you, you take issue with that or not, but nonetheless, Do you look at this and say to yourself that the Biden administration is supposed to look at this and say that they're going to stand down and put somebody else in that place? That does not seem to be realistic. They have to pray and hope that that, that Trump is is the candidate, which you're saying that's going to be the case. And then it's some kind of strange game of chicken, which it seems to be. I mean, what what are you suggesting here? 
Andrew, the reason why I came into the studio rather than doing it home, the reason why I put on this monkey suit is because I have never been more serious in my life. And I've had conversations with you and other journalists over the last few weeks. The weakest candidate against Donald Trump is Joe Biden. Now, hold on there. Frank Luntz responding. I mean, Frank wants a pat on the back for showing up to work. You hear him there? The only reason I came to the studios and put on this monkey suit. Was he talking about his suit, by the way, or that terrible wig he puts on his head? I don't know which one he was referring to, but my goodness, it looks awful. It's like, all right, Frank, here's a pat on the back for showing up to the office instead of, you know, sitting at home in your underwear and pulling a Jeffrey Tubin when you're done on Zoom. Eesh. Any other Democrat would run further ahead. Any other Democrat would be beating Donald Trump right now. Joe Biden is falling further and further behind. Inflation is dropping as an issue. Crime is falling in most places, although there have been some issues over the last few weeks. Yes, immigration is a problem, but the quality of life is improving, and yet his numbers are getting worse. Trump has been indicted 91 times, and yet his numbers are going up. Why? Because the public is coming to a conclusion that Joe Biden cannot take this country forward, and he seems to be ignoring that conclusion, is determined to run. And frankly, for you viewers right there, if this continues... Donald Trump is the next president. Very concerned Frank Luntz there on CNBC. Coming up next after the news, we've got the Jordan Peterson tickets at 715 and a ton of drama in Jackson County. You don't want to miss out on next. All right. I I just want to pat this show, John, Mark, myself on the back here, and I'll do that uh, just coming up in a couple of minutes. I'm not going to take a lot of your time. Don't worry. Uh, You know, you're not going to have I'm not going to break John's back when I do it, but I did want to share something with you about this show that I'm uh, pretty happy with and pretty proud of. Glenn is hanging out. Oh, never mind. I'm not going to go to the phones. I'm going to wait on that. Um, I'll do it right now. So somebody in Kansas City, Missouri government sent me this text message in the last couple of days. And it was the newsletter for Kansas City, Missouri City Councilwoman Melissa Patterson Hazley. She is a third district at large. Third District, of course, is uh, east side of Kansas City. And she sends out these e-newsletters. I don't know if these are weekly e-newsletters or monthly. But she sends out her weekly e-newsletter. And uh, the first thing that she's got in her weekly e-newsletter is a link to the interview that she did on this show last week. And she writes here, Melissa Patterson Hazley joins... Pete Mundo, it says, uh, Melissa Patterson Hazley discusses the source of income ordinance and the need to collaborate with African-American landlords. African-American landlords are most likely to participate in the Section 8 voucher program and should have a seat at the table. So it's not that, you know, she put a link to an interview and a podcast from our show onto her e-newsletter for, let's be honest, a part of town that probably is not listening to this show a lot. It's that she put it first in her newsletter and she put it ahead of an interview she did on KCUR. That's the NPR affiliate in town, National Panhandler Radio, with Steve Kraske. So this show's interview got top billing on a newsletter for an East Side Councilwoman over woke National Panhandler Radio Affiliate KCUR. And to me, you know, a lot of you want to uh, rib and say, oh, you know, when it comes to certain politicians, you're too soft this, too soft that, whatever it might be. Our goal is to talk to everybody in this town that we can and have that conversation and hope that they'll come on this show, whether it's Mike Kehoe, who's running for governor of Missouri, coming up at eight, Bill Eigel, who's, you know, uh, Missouri Freedom Caucus guy running for governor, Laura Kelly in Kansas, Quinton Lucas, Melissa Patterson Hazley. It doesn't matter, John. We want to talk to all them because and Emmanuel Cleaver. On Emmanuel that. Cleaver. Mm-hmm. We've totally lost it. We've lost it as a country. We've lost it as a region. We've lost it as a city. And it's part of the reason we find ourselves in these awful times that we're in right now. And we're just going to try to get these people to talk because what you see right now is a media landscape where people feel like with social media platforms and everything else, they don't need what we would view as traditional media 
to get their message out there. They're afraid to step on the rake and have it hit them in the face. And yes, you got to ask them tough questions when appropriate. But it doesn't mean you, you know, need to be a total douche about it, which a lot of people want to be. And by the way, the people that want to act like that are the same people who, you know, don't want to look in the mirror as to why we find ourselves in this awfully divisive and terrible political climate that doesn't look like it's getting better anytime soon. And I'm not saying that we're like changing the world or anything, but if we could have those conversations here in Kansas City on KCMO, we're damn sure going to do it. And when I have somebody send me that, you know, we get top billing on a councilwoman on the east side of Kansas City's e-newsletter, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that. 913-408-7957 is how you join us on KCMO. The jobs report is coming out in three minutes. We'll have the update for you here right after the news. Glenn is in Kansas City. What's up, Glenn? Morning, Pete. Uh, just a quick comment on uh, the partisanship. Uh, we always had right, left leaning, but now I think in the last four years or so, it is off the chart. I mean, it's R or D. There's nothing else that matters. I mean, it, you could see it coming um, when you lost the bet where you did your impersonation of Ray Stevens, the streak, where you played the part of Esther. That was a bet you should have never lost. And. It was just basically because people went down and they pulled the D lever. Uh, that was it. You had a debate yesterday with uh, Larry. Oh, and yeah. And I'm not going to go what was in it. You know, what? It, what is a man and a seven-year-old child? And it was like you telling a six-year-old there's no Santa Claus. Mm-hmm. And it's not just local. It's national. Yeah. No, That's I mean what the, people look for now. The ticket splitting that used to be a thing uh, all over the country is dead. Thank you, Glenn. I mean, it's it is dead, and it's not good that we don't even look at candidates now and say to ourselves, "Okay, well, let's analyze them for who they are and what they believe." Now it's just go right on down the line, and I don't see it getting better this year, and I don't know when it's going to get better. The jobs report is 90 seconds away. We'll have reaction to that, plus you next on KCMO. Holy smokes. This jobs report, my goodness. All right, uh, here are the numbers. The expectations were for 185,000 jobs in January. The number came in nearly double that at 353,000 jobs. Unemployment rate, 3.7% versus the 3.8% expected. Wage inflation, 4.5% increase. It was expected the wage inflation would be 4.1%. This is a much stronger report than what was expected, obviously, um, by the experts, by Wall Street, by everybody else. And uh, this just came out here in the last couple of minutes. So we're reacting to this in real time on KCMO. When can we expect the revision? Well, yeah, I, right? it, it may come. It'll come. I mm-hmm. mean, I don't think it'll be split in half, but it has been revised down most months. You're absolutely right about that. that. That's one thing we should keep up with a little more. Maybe. Yes, right? we should. We could Why do we get the? Is it, do we have a producer who can do that? By the way, maybe we do. Maybe. No, we do. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right about that, though. I I, I got to find the revisions, um, but this number right now is enormous. Uh, looking through some of the reasons uh, behind this jobs report. All right, here we go. Employment in health care rose 70,000. Retail trade employment increased by 45,000. Social assistance rose by 30,000. Manufacturing edged up 23,000. Government employment trended up once again, 36,000 government jobs. Now, the average monthly gain for government jobs in 2023 was 57,000. Federal government up 11,000 and local government was up 19,000. That does not include education. So these are the numbers that are dropping right now when it comes to this jobs report. Listen, I want to see people work. I think it's great. Um, I want to see, see people employed. I'm also curious how much of this is people potentially adding jobs 
to keep up with inflation to some degree. Um, I'm curious to know what this means when it comes to savings, which we know is still not in the place that it needs to be because of inflation. And then, you know, how the markets react. I don't think the markets are going to react positively to this because it means the economy is still running pretty hot, which means the interest rates are not going to be cut. And I don't think they should be cut, by the way. I've said that as much as I know that means more pain for the American consumer. I do not believe that they should be cutting interest rates right now, because with this jobs report, you will skyrocket inflation further if you start cutting rates and people start running out again to buy cars, to buy homes, to do things like that. Not that I don't want them to. I do want them to. But you will take inflation, which has come under control somewhat. I mean, it's still higher than it needs to be. And you will skyrocket that said inflation once again. So I, the markets probably will not react kindly to this at all. Um, and we'll see what happens when they open up here in one hour. Now the Dow implied open is off 100 points. So that number is trending down here in the last few minutes in the wake of this uh, jobs report. But obviously, it's a huge number. Um, it's uh, much larger than what we expected at 185,000. And if we can get some numbers on how these things have been revised down in recent months, uh, we'll try to get that here to you soon on KCMO Talk Radio. Now, on that note, uh, here's a report that came down from the Washington Post last night. Inflation has fallen. Why are groceries so expensive? Americans are finally getting a break from inflation with prices for gasoline, used cars, and health insurance all falling over the past year. Relieving families ahead of Joe Biden's 2024 re-election bid. But prices remain painfully high for one particularly frequent purchase, groceries. And ask any family right now, you know, myself included, you go to the grocery store and I don't care where you shop. You go to hy V, you go to Price Chopper, you go to Sam's Club, I, I, it does, Costco, it doesn't matter where you go. If you're getting out of there at a decent number, I, good for you. Because, you know, we track that stuff in our household and I am just blown away. I don't feel like we've got a bunker full of dry food, but damn, um, every month I'm like, we spend how much on just food in this house? It's unbelievable. So grocery prices have jumped 25% over the past four years. That outpaces overall inflation of 19% during the same period. And while prices of appliances, smartphones, and a smattering of other goods have declined, writes the Washington Post, groceries got slightly more expensive last year. With sharp jumps for beef, sugar, and juice, among other items. Stubbornly high grocery prices represent a critical drain on the finances for tens of millions of Americans and remain, along with housing, perhaps the most persistent economic challenge for Joe Biden's administration as it tries to convince Americans the economy is back on solid footing. So if Donald Trump is looking to get inroads to people that might not have voted for him four years ago or eight years ago, nobody wants to hear about him. Nobody wants to hear about his legal issues. Nobody wants to hear about 2020. All people are going to want to hear about, and if you really want to connect with folks, and that's where he claims he's, you know, the best at connecting with people, you will do a deep dive and you will hammer families. You will talk about grocery prices and you will make this issue number one, two, and three, because I'm telling you, it is one of those things that impacts people who are Republicans, Democrats, independents. And it connects with them. If you can actually go out there and explain to them why we're in this place that we're in. Dennis is in Bonner Springs. What's up, Dennis? You're on KCMO Talk Radio. Hi, Pete. Hey, uh, I know you guys can't see everything that's thrown out there, but the uh, former vice president in a speech yesterday uh, addressed the grocery prices. And it's the grocery stores are ripping us off. Who said that? The former vice president that sits in the White House now with, <laughs> yeah, whatever her name is, the, the lady that you guys <laughs> made fun of. Okay, she's made fun of her name. <laughs> the former the vice president. I was like, I was like, who is he is. talking about? I was like, are you doing the yeah. Biden thing? Are you talking about Al Gore? I was trying to figure out where you were going with that, but that's oh, well no, done. The former vice president in yeah. the White House right now. Yes, 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 that guy. So, anyway, yeah, he had a speech yesterday where he addressed this. And it's the grocery stores are ripping us off now. 
It, when the gas co- uh, oil companies are making profits, they're ripping us off. When it, the grocery stores are make or the you know, which I understand, the food prices went up and never came down. I've talked to managers of a Sam's Club in different places, and they've told me if if they gave us the markup that they were given by like let's just say a cereal company, I won't name mm-hmm. them. He goes, you, you would basically, we wouldn't be able to sell it. Yeah. So, well, but, I, know, listen, I, you're good. right. You're, you're right to point that out. Of course, it's mostly uh, nonsense, but that also leads me into this point here, Dennis, in the Washington Post article that says the Biden administration has said grocery stores can do more to alleviate the sticker shock facing shoppers. An administration spokesman also cited actions it has taken to ease fertilizer prices, improve the capacity of meat and poultry industries, and advance an antitrust agenda to increase competition in the ag sector. The administration, this is a statement, the administration is cracking down on uh, on exploitive and anti-competitive behavior in meat and poultry markets. There we go. Big meat. You guys like big meat in there? You a fan I'm of big fan meat? Of big meat. All right, Mark likes big meat. They're going. It's is all about big meat. Tyson chicken. All yeah, that. yeah. You know Joe. He's. Uh, you know Joe's going to be on it when we talk about big meat. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. He's going to take care of them. Don't you worry. The administration's cracking down on uh, the meat and poultry markets, supporting state law enforcement efforts to stop the practices that raise food prices, and pursuing all available avenues to lower grocery prices for families. This story is about inflation and how bad economic policy from the government can create awful economic circumstances for the middle class. And the more government involvement, the more they try to, quote unquote, help, oftentimes the worse the middle class is going to be. The more government involvement, the less middle class you typically often have. And that's what we're seeing play out right now in real time. The wage gap. um, The wealth gap is growing, and in large part, you can point it all back to too much government spending during COVID and thereafter, and we're still, unfortunately, reaping what we sowed during that time. But a jobs report this morning that absolutely is on fire, 353,000 jobs added. The expectations were for 180. So it's great, but here's the thing. Uh, If people are still saying in polls that they don't think the economy is in a great place— Joe walking around bragging about a job support, I'm not convinced that's going to be the difference maker that he thinks it is. 913-408-7957. Mike Kehoe, the lieutenant governor of Missouri, he's also running to be your next governor. He's going to be here in the studio on KCMO Talk Radio. Top of the hour, 8.05, as uh, we continue through the 7 o'clock hour on 95.7 FM. All right, we've got these numbers. Got to give the staff credit uh, for this. Able to pull it quickly for us here on KCMO Talk Radio. We just talked about this uh, jobs report. Came out red hot, 353,000 jobs in January. The expectations were for 185,000. So in December... Just coming out. The December jobs report actually was revised up. Despite the fact that 10 of the last 12 months had seen a downward revision in their jobs numbers. So this is an upward revision for December by over 100,000 jobs. Well, then you see the jobs numbers come in double the expectations for January. So this is an interesting time right now. Inflation is still an issue, not as big of an issue as it was, but it's still an issue. You have an upward revision for the jobs report in December, and now you have a January jobs report that blows through expectations. And by the way, uh, wage inflation went up 4.5% beyond the expectations. There's just no way the Fed can logically cut rates, not just in March, but any time in the second quarter. I I don't see how they could possibly do it. So... uh, We'll be following this on KCMO. Uh, The Dow implied open is off uh, about 80 points. That's not a big number, but we'll watch it closely as we roll through the morning on KCMO Talk Radio. Mike Kehoe is going to be in the studio uh, top of the hour. Do not miss him as we uh, get set for this Missouri governor's race that's going to be getting hot and heavy pretty soon. Just watch out. He's going to be here in Kansas City, and we got a lot to talk to him about as we get into the 8 o'clock hour. And then... 
Um, our Friday feature segment, we've enjoyed doing this the last couple of months, where we have people into the studio for a half hour on Fridays who are just interesting folks who have been around Kansas City for a long time, or really any period of time. But uh, today's guest is Mike Thompson, uh, former meteorologist here in town. He's now in the Kansas State Senate, so he's going to join us from 9 to 9.30. Uh, don't miss it. That's going to be a very good time as uh, we get into the 9 o'clock hour. And then Ray Stevens has your next chance, your last chance on KCMO to win Dr. Jordan Peterson tickets. He's going to be at Cable Dahmer Thursday, February 15th. That'll be taking place uh, coming up at uh, 10.15 to start off his show. Day after the parade. Yes. <laughs> Look at you predicting the future there. How about that? Uh, that's You know, here's the thing, though. You're going to have to pick between Dr. Jordan Peterson and politics in a pint. Ooh. Yeah. 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 So I didn't want to say that out loud, but you're going to have to pick. Mm-hmm. Now, if you win the tickets through KCMO, I'll understand if you can't come out to politics in a pine and leave summit. Or how about this? Our Kansas audience goes to Jordan Peterson. Our Missouri audience comes to politics in a pine and leave summit at Tiffin Jace, which you got to RSVP for at KCMOTalkRadio.com. What's our time frame? Six to seven thirty. So you could maybe Almost. maybe you could go to Cable Dahmer after that. What's that Almost. drive? Well, that's what ten minutes. Yeah, it's not that far. No, okay, we're in the same yeah. same neighborhood. Okay, all right, we've got it all you figured could, out. You could hit two. Okay, you yeah. can get to both. There you go. Get uber conservative that night. <laughs> yeah. Well, Peterson's not necessarily conservative. He's just common sense. Yeah, straight ahead, you know? I, he's just kind of like libertarian, straight shooter, conservative ish. But mm-hmm. I agree. I wouldn't put Jordan Peterson in a bucket when it comes yeah. to framing him as something politically. I just like, well, I call it common sense. Yes. I just like what he says. I, Master of the obvious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, exactly what Jordan Peterson is. So you can get Bill Eigel for Politics in a Pint from like 6 to 7 in Lee's Summit. Drive up to Cable Dahmer and get Jordan Peterson. That's a hell mm-hmm. of a Thursday night. And it would be. Uh, going to be. I may have to do it myself. That's, <laughs> uh, that's what I'm going to be doing on uh, February 15th. Sorry, I can't hang around Politics in a Pint. I got to go see Jordan. At Cable Dahmer Arena. So there you go. Um, (laughs) uh, Oh, gosh. How about this? 79-year-old retired public school employees in jail for allegedly sending inappropriate messages to a minor. Uh, This is in Michigan. Another reason our kids should not be on social media. Another reason the government should be doing something about this in the wake of Josh Hawley ripping Mark Zuckerberg two days ago. State police said they were tipped off in September that a retired middle school employee, Sue Ann Ash, had allegedly been texting and using Snapchat to send the inappropriate messages. Boy, 79 years old. Talk about thirsty. Wow. Police launched an investigation into an interview of an unidentified minor. In Traverse City, Michigan, authorities also obtained warrants for Ash's home, which resulted in police seizing several electronic devices. The devices were subsequently sent to the state police computer crimes unit for analysis. Police have not released any details as to what the messages to the minor contained, though they note the victim knew her. A report was first filed on January 8th. The former school employee turned herself in. According to police, she's being held on a $5,000 bond. She worked as a paraprofessional at a middle school and retired back in September. She began working for the school back in 2012. What a freak. And I don't mean that as a compliment. I mean, what a weirdo. 79 years old lady hitting on a middle school kid, allegedly, through Snapchat. I... We have, and listen, I know it's not the first time we've seen these relationships. Heck, we've had them here in Olathe. Uh, Wasn't there something, there was one in Olathe in the last year. There was one, I want to say up in the Liberty area or somewhere up north. Uh, We've had issue in Belton. Belton, that's the one I'm thinking of. one, Park Hill South, I think. Yes, 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 you're right. And then the one in Olathe. And now we have this thing in, and these are all over the country, but we got this one in Michigan. And oftentimes it happens through social media as if we need another reason to make sure our kids are not actively on social media, at least monitoring as best we can. And if the government ever wants to do something about it, well, now would be the time to get their act together. 
front page of the New York Post right now is this story on these Kansas City Chiefs fans who were found dead after watching the last game of the regular season a month ago against the Chargers. I I can't believe it. I mean, this story is getting so much national attention. And, you know, I'm sitting here looking at this, and it's like, okay, now we found out that the substances that were in the bodies of David Harrington, Clayton McGinney, and Ricky Johnson here in the Northland, the guys who were found dead on the back porch of their buddy's house after watching the Chiefs game, cocaine and fentanyl. I mean, wow. Talk about a bombshell. I can't believe it. I, I don't know why this is getting so much national attention. You go to NewYorkPost.com right now. This is the lead story. These guys in the Northland. I feel like this is getting more national attention than it's getting local attention. I've had so many people from national media ask it. Oh, you guys doing this wall to wall? No, not really. I mean, yeah, it, it's weird and it's crazy that three guys are found dead in lawn chairs on the back porch of their buddy's house after watching the Chiefs game. But like, I, are we really surprised at all that fentanyl is found in their system? And I'm not saying that to not be empathetic. I do have great empathy. I mean, you know, they they got bad drugs probably. And I had heard off the record from, you know, some folks who knew some of the people involved here that one of these individuals was notorious for oftentimes getting bad drugs. So, I, like, okay, fentanyl overdoses, it's terrible to say this. But they're happening every day in this country. Sometimes people know what they're taking, but oftentimes they don't. They're getting bad drugs laced with fentanyl. It's why we had over 100,000 overdose deaths last year. Poisonings, whatever you want to call them. I mean, frankly, they're poisonings. If it's fentanyl, it's a poisoning. And the fentanyl's coming from China in the Mexico. It's flowing right across the border with 8.5 million people. And it's killing Americans every day. And you just heard my Kehoe say... 18 to 42 year olds, it's the biggest cause of death in that age range is fentanyl related ODs or poisonings. And I mean, we're not talking nearly enough about it, except for when there's some, I don't know, sexy national storyline. The only conclusion I can come to in part is that it's because of the Chiefs. I don't think if this was the Patriots. The Seahawks, the Broncos, the Raiders, this would be a national story. I think the Chiefs, anything Chiefs are national right now. You know, Travis Taylor, Mahomes, the whole thing. I think that that's part of the appeal to national media on this story, John. There's a lot of intrigue to it. And I guess we're all junior detectives having watched Law and & Order and <laughs> Criminal Minds. And so, no, seriously. Yeah, no, you're right. No, I mean. Forensic we, Files. That's my favorite. I mean, you, it's kind of the law of preservation. You have to take the information you have and make some deductions. And so... The reason Dateline in 2020 exists is you get some obvious things and then they work backwards and like, oh, surprise. Yeah. Well, there's, I don't know, some there's some surprises here maybe for family members, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's the intrigue, I guess, that people are all interested in here because I, I was guess my point would be maybe if it was foul play, then is there a story? Well, you see what I'm saying? But yes, I do. People wouldn't be as interested in it, maybe. Foul play mm -hmm. is more compelling to me than fentanyl poisonings i like okay you know i don't know like i and and i'm not trying to make light or downplay it, it would but, become more commonplace yeah. if it were foul play i guess is what i'm saying and then becomes more into the average set of statistics i suppose yeah but i don't know foul this one play, has the intrigue away who what <sighs> yeah. i don't know it just seems so obvious to me that these guys got right. bad drugs went outside and froze to death Seemingly, I, I I just there's and and the other thing that drives me a little nuts personally, as someone who covers Kansas City news every day, is that I could find national media half a dozen more compelling stories in five minutes than this, that is actually impacting this town on a daily basis. Bad ordinances passing City Hall, right? The the cop issue, the Eric Devalkin air case. Like, I think Fox yeah. News should be covering, and the New York mm -hmm. Post, if they want to cover a story in this town, cover Eric Devalkin Air. Not three guys that got bad drugs and, you know, died in a lawn chair on the back porch of their friend's house. Like, I, and, and I don't mean the sound, and I know it's coming off this way, so I'm backtracking on it. I don't mean to sound um, insensitive. 
But man, I, I just, I think the sexiness of football and Chiefs and everything else makes this compelling to people. That's it. Nothing more. And then you've got this story from KNBC Channel 9. Deaths have surged 700% in Jackson County. Opioid deaths. 700% in Jackson County since 2018. Put that into perspective. 195 opioid overdoses, poisonings, whatever you want to call them, in 2022. That is a seven-fold increase in four years. And we're just whistling right past the graveyard. And not only that, we've got a city council that is passing and creating these fountain passes. Do you see these things we talked about a couple of weeks ago? These fountain passes that allow people to get IDs who can't get them. And they claim it's for low-income people and people who are homeless. It's nonsense. The group that's going to use it the most are those who are not here legally. That's in large part who it's for. And um, it's not their fault that there's a 700% increase in opioid deaths, but these things do weave together. The border crisis is not just tied to 8.5 million people. It's also directly tied to what we're seeing on the drug front and the fentanyl front. Coming up on KCMO, um, can you think of your some of your favorite TV shows that have gone woke? I've got one of mine, and the latest example is really pathetic. We'll get to it next on KCMO. we got a half hour till our buddy Mike Thompson joins us in the studio for a featured Friday segment. Former longtime meteorologist here in town. Now he's in the Kansas Senate. Derek is checking in from Oak Grove on a Friday. Happy Friday, Derek. What's up, brother? Hey, uh, how's it going? Uh, first thing I wanted to say, I, I totally agree with your thoughts on those guys that died in the Northland. I think most people around here kind of think that they just had some bad drugs and the guy took them outside and wanted to make it look like they maybe froze to death so he didn't get in trouble. And I think a lot of people around here are really familiar with like people getting bad drugs and we don't have the Kansas City Star really anymore. So there's just not a lot of local media. That's just what kind of my yeah. thoughts on it. And I agreed with what you said. But um, my question was on immigration. You know, there's a lot going on with the Texas border and, you know, all the borders. But there's the migrants that are already here, and that's its own problem. Mm-hmm. What do you think about um, the things that cause the problems in the first place or cause the scenarios that make the migrants leave? Like, um, you know, if we put economic sanctions on a country, then that just makes their economic situation harder, and that probably creates more migrants. I know, for, and like one other thought I had, like, a really good example is whenever the United States famously stopped uh, trading with Cuba, because Cuba is a large sugar exporter. When we cut that trade off, it kind of drove them into the arms of the Soviet Union. And you kind of see that happening whenever we put these sanctions on other countries and then we refuse to trade with them. It kind of drives them into the arms of China or Russia because that's their only option to trade with them. So it kind of almost like hurts us twice. It creates these migrants that want to come to America and it also kind of drives these other countries into the arms of Well, listen, I I, I think I think I think when it comes to, um, you know, Cuba, if you want to use that example, you know, that that JFK did that after, of course, Castro had been in power for a few years. So I don't think it's fair to blame us for Cuba becoming Cuba. I don't don't necessarily I'm I'm not like trying to cast blame. I just mean like those scenarios are kind of common throughout South America and Central America, where once we stop trading with those countries, it just kind of like forces them like now they have to trade and have, you know, um, more intimate relations with, you know, Russia or China. Is there one in particular you're referring to or an example that you're talking about specifically uh, in South I think America? Venezuela is, prob- Venezuela is probably like a really good example. I know there's a large amount of migrants coming from them. And, you know, obviously we put a lot of sanctions on that country. And um, whenever we, I think we've like froze their bank accounts because there's the BRICS and the petrodollar, they're trying to sell their oil to the other countries in different currencies. And they're trying to get around that. And we're, you know, obviously we want the petrodollar to stay. That's what holds up our, you know, our, makes the dollar the world. Listen, what, what, I, what I would we say, don't... what I would say, Derek, is uh, you're getting into a lot of, uh, I mean, 
different conversations. I understand. I mean, Venezuela has been dealing with hyperinflation for the better part of a decade, and that's also not the United 100%, States' fault. I, 100%. So what, what well, I would, you know, I get that we don't make it better. Listen, what our job, and uh, Derek, good to hear from you, man. Our, our job here in the U.S. Is, is simply to, yes, allow fair asylum claims. So even if you're someone who says, hey, these countries are hellholes, these people are fleeing and, and fearing for their lives, they have legitimate asylum claims. Even if that's, let's say, your angle, I'm not saying it's Derek's, but even if that's your angle, then you've got to look at it and say, okay, let's make sure that those who are coming across the border have legitimate asylum claims. And the majority do not have legitimate asylum claims. So even if you're saying, hey, we should take people who have real asylum claims we're not even doing the legwork because there's just too many bodies flowing across to even comprehend who's got a legitimate asylum claim and that's part of the problem as an older person Derek's premises all start with the u.s it's not like the u.s woke up said hey let's don't trade with venezuela Mm -hmm. let's see what happens yeah Uh, let's uh let's uh let's uh, not get sugar from cuba no they moved missiles or allegedly moved missiles in they were already in bed with the people that he's in, kind of inferring that we drove them into. Yeah. No, no, there's more that happened prior to mm-hmm. his starting point. I'm trying to play Derek's game and say, well, even if he's right, where mm-hmm. people have legit asylum claims, and they mm-hmm. do, sure, we are so beyond the point of saying accept people because of their asylum claims. We don't know who's who anymore. That's the problem. If you at least close the border, and what remember what Trump did with stay in Mexico was basically say, hey, if you've got a legit asylum claim, you stay in Mexico till we have time to process all this. What happened, by the way? A lot of people didn't come anymore because they weren't claiming asylum anyway. They didn't want to stay in Mexico. So I, that's a perfect example of how stay in Mexico works. If you are truly fleeing and fearing for your life and you want to claim asylum, and if you can't stay in Mexico for a little bit until we can process you, then it can't be that bad. And then we also allow people who are trying to go through the immigration process legally to have a chance. And right now they don't. Give me a TV show that for you has gotten woke and unwatchable. For me, it's Law and Order. And one of the recent examples on Law and Order is just it's it's stomach churning. If you're like me and you're a father of two daughters, soon to be three, um, it's approaches like this and attitudes like this that are beyond disturbing. We used to watch Law and Order all the time. We were Law and Order fanatics. Going SVU in particular, mm-hmm. uh, SVU. I mean, you go back to the Elliot Stabler days. Oh man, that show was good. On at my house, I mm-hmm. lo- I could watch the old reruns all day, every day. <laughs> I do. <laughs> All day Saturday, anyway. Now I know what you're doing when I text you about the show <laughs> mid-afternoon. I'm not around for college sports on Saturday. <laughs> I'm over on Ion. So it, this is from a recent episode on Law & Order. It's gone viral. Of Law & Order just going insanely uh, woke. And to give you the backdrop here before I play the clip itself, uh, basically what this is, is it is uh, a character in Law & Order who's a white woman who was sexually assaulted by a black man and she declines to press charges because she's privileged and doesn't want the black perpetrator to go to jail take a look and you hear the cops trying to convince her to press charges and she's insistent that she shouldn't because well if i do that he's not going to have a chance in life take a listen to this clip from a recent law and order that's gone viral but natalie jay watson raped you you think I forgot? How could I? This entire trial has been an exercise in reminding me. And this is your chance to do something about it. I am going to. Believe me. Because I can. I can afford therapy. I have that luxury. And maybe one day I'll be okay. But if that teenager goes to prison, it may not be. Ever. I don't want that. Natalie, wait. Huh? 
I'm getting pissed now. That's law and order. A white woman. So now the approach here by law and order is a white woman seeking justice for being sexually assaulted by somebody who happens to be black is literally oppression and racist. That's her attitude in her own mind. Now, credit to the cops, right, for like trying to convince her, no, you need to press charges. You were assaulted. Doesn't matter what color this person is. And she's convincing herself not to do it in the name of equity, racism. You can hear her say it. There's like, well, I'm I'm white. I can go to therapy. And if he goes to prison, he may never have a chance. I, 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 I'll be able to recover. I can afford it. Now, I think that's extreme, but do I think there are people out there who have been brainwashed into that kind of an attitude on the world? I do. And I think that we are living through some of that every single day. Extreme, yes, but I don't think it's maybe as extreme and as radical of a thought process as um, we might believe it to be or want it to be. Because that's kind of what we've been told over the last couple of years. And it's only become to a fever pitch, by the way, as of late. You know, it all kicked off in 2020. And in some cases, it's only gotten worse since then. Now, I do think there's an awakening to a lot of this ridiculousness. Like, if you commit a crime, I don't care what color you are. Uh, there is prison sentence. That's just how this goes. Uh, it doesn't matter what your background is. But heck, here in Jackson County, in large part, I believe that's the attitude of our prosecutor. Criminals are the real victims because society let them down. And that's more or less what you're hearing in that law and order clip. Society let this sexual assaulter down. So therefore, I should not press charges, says woke white lady, because, well, this person was never given a chance anyway. They were always behind the eight ball in life. So I'm just going to have to live with what happened to me and I'll go to therapy for it. That is insane. And, you know, as the father of soon-to-be three daughters, the notion that that is ever a mindset that we should normalize in this country is pretty sick and disturbing. We'll get to buy, sell, hold uh, coming up on KCMO Talk Radio. Mike Thompson is going to be here in the studio at the top of the hour from 9 to 9.30. I'm reading some of your texts, by the way, on shows that have gone woke. Someone said Survivor's gone woke. I don't know how Survivor goes woke. How does it even work? They're just on an island trying to... What, make it through the island? I haven't seen Survivor in 20 years at this point. I didn't even know Survivor, it was still on. Survivor, the vegan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any NBC show, that's a good one. On the oh, yeah, it's rampant through the major network. Doctor Who, uh, I, don't, I don't watch that show either. I'm just reading some of your answers here on KCMO Talk Radio. But anyway, yeah, it's, it's hey, that's how Yellowstone, by the way, becomes a huge hit going back three, four years now. Be, uh, we, I was underwhelmed with that, but that's a whole other episode. Uh, save that one for another show, John. This will go right up there with your enjoying fillet of fishes, as far as I'm concerned. Ah, uh, uh, no, sir. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, he wants the debate. He wants it. Yellowstone is so woke. It was killing. Oh no! Oh. All right, he said it. He's uh, oh man. I got a break. I, I got a break. I got a break. We got to get to buy, sell, hold. We'll, maybe we'll save that for the end of the show. How's that sound? Mike Thompson, top of the hour. Pete Mundo on KCMO.